and we're live. All right. The chair notes the time is 6.03. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Uh, Mr. Craig Meadows? Present. Mr. Edward Henry? Present. Mr. Philip White is not here. And Mr. David Sloboder is not here. But we have a quorum for taking testimony. A quorum uh, three is, uh, is permitted. We, have, we need at least three to take testimony. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Knight Malloy will be on um, and Jacinta Williams, a planner for the town. And we also have an attendance, attorney Carol Lynn Murray of KP Law to provide us guidance and assistance. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA web page. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarifications or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name, address to, to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by a public meeting for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and is evalu evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file the decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for the variance to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded with the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2025-04, Wayfinders Inc requests a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct a 31 unit mixed income rental housing on a three story development with 14 proposed parking spaces on the premises of 31 Southeast Street, map 14A, parcel 20 in the RBC Village Center Residence Zoning District. In a 47 unit mixed income rental housing in, three store, in a three story building, with 46 proposed parking spots on the premises of 70 Belcher Town Road, map parcel 15C, 58, 15C, 59, 15C, 60, in RN and FPC, neighborhood residence and flood prone conservancy zoning district. This is continued from our September 26th meeting, 2024. Also tonight, ZBA FY 2024-17, Jonathan Clay requests for a special permit under section 6.3 and 5.10 of the zoning bylaw to create a flag lot and to construct a single family house on the premises at 47 Redgate Lane, map 11D parcel 166 RN neighborhood residence zoning district. This is continued from our July 11th, 2024 hearing. Following that, there's a 
there's a general public comment period, and then there's a, a period of new business that or business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. Before we begin tonight, I want to start say something at the start of the hearing. We don't have a sufficient number of members and panels for the ZBA 2027, 2024-17, 47 Redgate Lane Special Permit application to decide that issue tonight. The applicant has agreed to continue the hearing until October 24th. I suspect that there might be members of the public who are attending this hearing because they are interested in this application, and I want to let them know that we will, that we will be considering a motion to move that to uh, the October 24th. So to begin with, I would like to entertain a motion to continue the motion, the public hearing on ZBA FY 2024-17, 47 Redgate Lane until October 24th at 6 p.m. Do so I have such a motion? I so moved. moved and seconded. Any discussion? No discussion. The vote occurs on the motion to continue the hearing on ZBA FY 2024-17 until October 24th at 6 p.m. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. The vote is three to nothing. The vote passes. Now let's turn to the first item on the agenda tonight. ZBA FY 2025-04 Wayfinders Inc. requesting a special, uh, I mean, a comprehensive permit for 31 Southeast Street and for 70 Belchertown Road. This is, is continued from September 26th, 2024 meeting. There have been a number of submissions since that time, uh, since our meeting. I want to read through those. Uh, first, there was a submission from the app. These are all from the applicant. Affordability excerpts and from, the, from their comprehensive permit application. This was submitted on October 4th. A management plan documents also submitted on October 4th. I think those came from the original uh, highlights from the original application as well. Uh, ZBA rental bylaw waiver request. I think that's the original. There's a HUD HQS, which I think is Housing Quality Services Inspection Checklist that was um, submitted on October 10th. The second one was also submitted. There was a form as opposed to a checklist that was also submitted October 10th. A management plan excerpt, Wayfinders Comprehensive Permit Applications. That's an excerpt from the management plan from the original application but that excerpt was submitted on October 4th. A laundry room um, design memo submitted October 4th. Photometric um, Belchertown for Belchertown Road, that was submitted October 4th. A photometric for Southeast Street, that was also submitted October 4th. A rental bylaw waiver draft from 10-4-2024. It looks like there's a second one as well. I don't know if it's a different waiver, but we have a second waiver request um, draft of 10-4-2024. Uh, we have some architectural drawings for the rooftop equipment from, um, bo for both sites, as well as additional hearing materials uh, submitted on October, 20, October 4th, 2024. I think that is all the material that has been submitted. Is there anything else, uh, Ms. Williams? From the applicant, not at this time, no. And is there any other staff or public submissions that I do, am unaware of? Um, just the update from the wetland administrator that I sent earlier today. Oh, that's right. Yep, I saw that. Um, so we had two comment, comments on both sites from the wetland administrator. I think both um, that one of the one of the provisions. Uh, one site has been approved and one site needs to needs additional information if I read those correctly. And that's you, correct. And the applicant can give us more information on that, but I think there's been progress on the CONCOM front uh, in the last week. So what I'd like to do, and I know, I know this week we were going to focus on a couple of things. We had questions about um, lighting submittals, but lighting, we had um, questions about um, Lighting, site of the HVAC equipment on the top of the roofs, and the laundry was three, three questions we had from last week, and I know you've responded to all of those as well as the waiver request. So let's dispose of those first, since that's the questions from the last meeting, and then we can go into the subject matter of the meeting tonight, which is um, property management, income restrictions, and the financials. How does that work, Mr. Gruber? 
that sounds good. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, I there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask if Bruce could be um, Bruce Erlich from Wayfinders could be included as a panelist, and and yes. Yeah, so thank you. There we go. And I see Mr. Uh, who's going to represent? Who's going to make the presentation for you guys on those mm -hmm. um, issues that we're going to? Mr. Ehrlich, okay. All right. Give us your name and address for the record, Mr. Ehrlich, and you may proceed. Uh, Bruce Ehrlich, I'm the senior vice president for real estate development at Wayfinders. Great. All right. So, um, <clears throat> questions on uh, the first one was on the. Um, the photometrics and the lighting for the two sites. I and, and I, I'll be, I'll be presenting those. Um, All right. It's my name, Jamie, Gr James Gruber, uh, on behalf of Wayfinder, 1780 Main Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. Great. Uh, so we'll start with the, I guess, the photometric plans in our architect, um, Andrew uh, Bankston from the Narrow Gate will be here as, 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 as well. Um, okay. Okay, great. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay, great. Are you all able to see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so here's the photometric plan for Southeast Street. Uh, the building is located here. Um, uh, this is the new portion, new construction portion. The school is here. This is the existing parking area. Um, these, these small areas here are, are the, um, the foot candles, um, associated with um, the current uh, lighting that is proposed. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, all the lighting fixtures have been selected to minimize the um, light trespass beyond the uh, beyond the property. Um, they're they're all dark sky compliant, um, and uh, they're, they're restricted from providing any light from above. Um, the the paths of egress from the building and that sort of thing will be illuminated during night hours for safe entrances, um, and uh, lighting will operate from dusk to dawn with uh, motion sensors to dim down um, to thirty percent um, during periods of in inactivity to um, to meet with current code requirements. Uh, lighting control systems will help ensure that lighting is dimmed um, during the evening hours um, and when the exterior parking pathways are not occupied. Um, and uh, we don't anticipate any waivers needed um, with this design as it uh, currently um, is in accordance with the, um, the town's uh, bylaws. So, there's uh there's a couple different lights. These are the um the fixtures are in this um style and we have uh these are called uh they're about you know light bollards or 10 foot tall bollards are along here and along the path. They illuminate the um the parking area and we have a few um exterior lights on the um ex on the building that um, provide illumination for um, the the entrance area back here and a light bollard here. Um, and then a couple of the light poles back here that are um, slightly higher at uh, 20 feet. So this is the um, the lighting plan at Southeast Street. Are there any questions? I have a, just a quick question. On our, what we received, I couldn't see the colors but it looks to me if you can just increase it uh, the magnification just a bit and sc scroll over so that there's some of the blue um it looks to me like blues are all zeros i mean there's there's no light trap trespass beyond or in the blue area and that's bordering the neighboring property and the group the reds cut the red coloration numbers are to kind of transition and then the green is what's intended what it will be lit is that correct um yeah i need to confirm with the with the architect on that the way that i was i was reading the plans is that they um 
they just denoted the different uh the different areas so yes the the pavement areas are are shown in green and the transition areas are in red and the um the average of the transition areas are 1.2 uh you know foot candles and then the pavement areas is an average of 2.8 yeah. so brighter so it, it that seems to track with what um you're saying yeah, my eyes aren't good enough to read what the numbers are in the blues, but it seems to me the numbers in the blues yeah. are zero. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's the only and that that applies for both drawings. And so that's my that's my one question. Okay. Any other members of the board have questions regarding the photometric plans? Could you repeat again what the averages are in the different areas? And I and and zoom in so that we could see. Okay, so the average in the um, in the red or maroon zone is uh, one point two uh -huh. uh, foot candles. In the in the average in the uh, pavement zone is um, twenty eight uh, point eight. Okay, and I'll, I can I can scroll in here. So here's the entrance to the parking area. This is the um, the the courtyard area there's a walkway here there's a, a a front entrance right here in the building here's another entrance on the uh, i guess that the first the first floor in this in this building that's that the stairs lead up to Then in the in the rear portion of the building, this is the the area of the parking back there. Some of the areas look rather high, as far as the amount of foot candles in in particular spaces. Is that because you couldn't spread the uh, lights out a little bit more? Um, when you say high, is there a, is there a particular area that you're, is it? I, I see fives, I see sevens. In this area here, yeah, it, it appears that there's, there's, there's a, a, you know, a light baller here and a light baller here as well. And there's a kind of a crossing there. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not shown on this plan, but, um, there is a, a ramp here that 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 goes across here that um you know that would that would be the access i guess to the to the rear portion um so that 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 could be a reason for that that they wanted to illuminate the area where where there is actually a designated crossing mm -hmm. but i can confirm that please Okay. Thank you. Yep. So you can just confirm that and just let the staff know, confirm that with the architect and, and let us know, okay? Okay. Lighting designer. And then are you able to see the photometric plan here for Belcher Town Road? Yep. Just a quick question. Can we confirm via email so that you know, if it's true, do we not have to bring it up at the next meeting? That's all I'm just questioning. And, and you are Michelle? So yeah, Michelle McAdair, sorry. I'm, I'm a senior project manager at Wayfinders. I think, Mr. Meadows, you'd be happy if it's confirmed by email, wouldn't you? That'll be fine. Yep. That's Thank fine. you. Yep. Okay. So... So this is the, um, the the front portion of the site here, where the the driveway access comes in, and then we have the parking area in the uh, in the rear of the site. With a, um, we have the the light ballers along the side here. That where there's a walkway here, and it illuminates the um, the, the the driveway. This is the rear uh, courtyard portion of the of the building. And this is the the front 
front entry, the covered covered entry here. Um, similar, the fixtures are um, a, a little bit different style, um, but they are all dark dark sky compliant. Um, and these are these are the uh, what's 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 proposed. There's going to be a, a, a ten foot tall version of that, as well as a, um, a slightly taller twenty foot version in the uh, rear of the of the um, prop property in, in, in parking lot area. And I'm happy to scroll through this, and we can kind of take a look, see where those those lights are located a few bollards out here pull there and the averages are shown here so on the pavement area it's a 1.7 foot candle and then in the maroon zone it's a 0.6 can you help me out? What are the what's the red line, both on the right hand and the left hand side? That's the approximate property line. Property line. Okay. So you do have some trespass over to the neighbors, and um, who's what's the neighboring property? I forget. It's on the on the left hand side. This drawing. It's a um, it's a, a single uh, single family home in between. Um, you, I, I'm trying to think what the adjacent property is. Is it, is it the service station uh, next to that, or a? Yeah. Um, I can look at, look that up. Okay, um, I, we've talked to the pro. I mean, have you had conversations with the property owner there? Um, yeah, we've we've been in communication um, with with the property owner there, and um, you know throughout the development. And as a result of that conversation, that they are um, copacetic with your lighting plan. Have you talked to them specifically about that? I guess that would be my only question. Okay, I'm you know I'm happy to I'm happy to do that with the with the lighting plan to uh, to show them what that is. Discuss that with them. Yeah, I mean, just just discuss it, and then you can um, let us know of your conversation with them via email as well. And okay. of course, if, if they have, if they wish to speak, they may do so at the next meeting. But um, that would be good if you do that. Okay. Great. All right. Anybody else have questions regarding the photometric plan? No, Mr. Chair. Good. All right. Oh, and where are the 20 foot ones again? Are those way in the back? Are those the 20 foot lights way in the back? Yeah, they're in this. So they're um, denoted by the, the LP one. And it, it, and it looks like this, this sort of rectangular symbol. So it, we have one here, one here, one here, one here, and here, here. Yeah, they're, they pretty much surround the parking area, surround the parking area. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. That's, I have no further questions about the lighting plan. Okay. Let's move on to, um, we we're going to talk about the um, HVAC on the rooftop. I noticed you, you sent us some drawings regarding that, or renderings, I guess they're not drawings. Yes, and uh, let me share that. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, this is 31 Southeast Street. Uh, the architect had, um, you know, modeled um, the, the, the equipment to um, some, you know, some generalized shapes here um, in, the, in the scale and location that they're um, currently proposed on the plans. Um, they are, uh, this is the, the rooftop equipment. So um, this is, you know, on top of the school here and then on the flat roof um, in this, in this location here um, behind the, 
the back of the, um, the, the sloped the roof in the front of the building here. So um, they had taken um, the, the software that they used to, you know, represent what, you know, you might see from the common and, um, you know, from that, you, you, you wouldn't, it, it wouldn't appear to project above the, uh, the ridge of the roof here. And um, as well as the, um, this, the school building here, what you see here is the, um, the elevator, um, like the, the top portion of the elevator, uh, um, part of the building here, so. So essentially it's not gonna be visible from the street. Yeah, correct, correct. From yeah, from from thirty one Southeast Street. As you go further back, you might see, you know, it might. It, it I think it projects a foot or so. Like a couple of the pieces right here may project a foot above the ridge. So you'd have to travel back, um, like eighty or ninety feet from the property line to just see, you know, the small portion that um peaks up above that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you find out for, for us, please, the lengths of the runs from the VRFs to the, to, well, each of the lengths of the runs, please. Okay. To the terminal units. Yeah, and I think that's why they're split up. Um, and when they went over that, um, the, the, I should have asked the question then, but I I didn't. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know now. Okay. Should look right. Okay. All right. All right. And I can show. Mr. Chair, sorry. Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Andrew Bankson, uh, Narrowgate Architecture. Uh, we're headquartered in in Boston. I just wanted to uh, uh, just a quick clarification from Mr. Meadows, the um, the um, the refrigerant runs from mm -hmm. the rooftop units to the air handlers within each unit. It's just yeah. an average run of well, the refrigerant. Not the average. Uh, the the exact, longest. The the exact lengths of the different runs, please. From of the each run from from the VRF to the terminal unit. Okay. Okay. Um, for each unit. Yes, please. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Again, uh, Mr. Meadows, they can submit that for the record, and we can review it next uh, at our next meeting. Is that great? I'm sorry, Steve. I, you... I should have said that more clearly. They can email that material into the into the planning staff, they can share it with us. And if we need, if need be, we can talk about it next week. Yes. Okay. All right, let's look at the 70 Belchertown Road. I'm assuming first off, you've got the same question, Mr. Meadows. Is that right? Yes, even more so there. Yeah. Okay, so um, the this is the, the rooftop equipment here um, that's located on the roof behind the, the pitch portion of the roof and the um, the architect showed a couple of the areas that you um, could see a small portion of the uh, equipment from the rear of the building, uh, the parking area. So that's that's where we would anticipate that you know it, it 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 would be visible and that's why it's shown um from these two vantage points and it's behind the um the ridge of the roof here so it's not visible from Belchertown road because it's behind the ridge yes All right, we just had the same question regarding the uh, runs for this property. Okay. All right, what's the next thing we're looking at? Um, 
laundry facilities. Yeah, and um, uh, at our last meeting, there was some interest in seeing if you could explore air, um, possibilities of additional laundry facilities uh, in both buildings. Yeah, and 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 we did that. We um we we performed that exercise with uh with with the architect and the and the design team. Um, what we found at uh, Belcher Town Road, um, or or uh, I'll start with South Thirty One Southeast Street, is that um there there wasn't any sort of surplus area um to add in a a laundry um room uh on on each level and um so it would either require you know removing a bedroom uh on one floor on on each floor or you know um to to make space for it or building out the the footprint um of the building um, additionally, at that site, it's sort of a split level, um, you know, configuration with the school um, building floors being offset from the new construction portion. So, you know, someone in, somewhere would have to take the take the elevator. So, the, you know, the people in the school would still either have to take the stairs or the elevator to get to a laundry facility. Um, and what you know, there was also a, a bunch of concerns sort of from property, from our property management staff and, and sort of operations kind of just, you know, being able to, um, you know, monitor and uh, one, one location. And um, that's why the preferred method there for wayfinders would be to have it, you know, on the, uh, on, on one room in the, in the lowest level. And um, a, a big portion of that as well is that um, the way we're able to um, work with a vendor that um, provides the laundry machines that also has a, a, a service schedule that um, can keep the machines up and running. Um, one of the issues that our team has run into with the, you know, the 800 units that, you know, we, we manage was that when a laundry machine goes down, it would be down for a little while and um, it it just you know the the vendor is able to have that up and running within forty eight hours, which actually you know provides a better service um, you know for the for the residents using the machine, um, and is, along with uh, monitoring that they're able to provide when the when the machines are are kind of grouped together in a in a larger um, configuration. Um, so where you know they can tell on their app if there's open machines, they can pay through that, um, you know, more easily than if it's if it's um, if it's split up. It doesn't. We're, we're not able to provide that. So that's why. So at thirty one Southeast Street, we we prefer to have one laundry room in the lowest level there. Um. So you, this will apply to both places. You manage a lot of units. Do you have other units, other developments where you have multiple laundry facilities in, in your buildings? And have you had that experience? Are you speaking from experience or have you always had a single locations for laundry and, and you're just speaking from the experience of having a single location? Well, we have single locations like the the building that I'm in now is a is a single location um, with you know two and three bedroom units and it's in its um, elevator access and and they're all in uh, one location. Um, one of the one of the adjacent buildings has laundry facilities on on every floor. Um, however, with the um, the way that you know. The, the laundry machines are, I guess, designated for the amount of units on each floor is that it, it turns out that, you know, there's, there's like the, the one to 10 ratio, which is, is, is the code is provided, I guess, you know, on, um you know, on, on each floor. And what they've found is that, you know, they're able to provide the monitoring service, the, the, the vendor's able to provide the monitoring service so people can check and see when those you know, machines are running. And it looks like, uh, Bruce, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think, I'm not on mute, am I? No, 
I think maybe I was about to say what picking up on your thing is that <clears throat> it's not just that the leasing company can better monitor the machines, but the leasing company, it's a very technologically sophisticated package they can provide um, when they've got a certain economy of scale where all of the residents in the building can have an app. And that app will tell them which machines are available. It'll tell them when their laundry is done. And so, you know, instead of having to go down, is a machine available or is it not available? Is my laundry done? They, our leasing company provides that technology to the residents and they can also pay for the machines on their phone. So the whole issue of, you know, making sure that there's enough coins available doesn't exist. That ability to provide that level of service to the tenants um, with the app is they 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 cannot they've told us they cannot do that if you have two machines here and two machines there and two machines there they they want a you know certain economy of scale or centralization of the facility for them to provide that those bells and whistles for the for the tenants hmm. well uh, i mean i i know i'm a little bit familiar with that my daughter had in college she was able to stay in a room and uh, monitor her laundry easily uh, through an app on her phone. It works, it works well. Um, I think that's a, a really good feature and it does reduce the sort of burden of having a single space. But I'm surprised that in this day and age, you can't, it has to be a single location. Uh, um, I don't think the machines have to talk to each other, but our, perhaps there's a, a Wi-Fi. I don't know if it doesn't, I'm surprised that that's the reason that they can't uh, at multiple locations. But uh, I have to leave that up to the to you guys to judge that and to the, the vendor. Um, you did look at so it's 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 for that reason as, as opposed to having to run extra lines from especially on the Belchertown Road site. There seemed to be you know some room underneath the eaves of the third floor that you could do that. But so the the real limitation is as much the technological advantage of having the app and the need the need to have the app to have the washers and dryers all in the same place and not the cost of running extra uh, sewage line, extra uh, lines water lines down and, and sewage lines down from a third floor location is that you're telling me that's the issue is more than the cost of constructing a second site for laundry you know it's 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 sort of multiple factors have of, you know, some of it is convenience for the tenants. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is there is or is not availability of square footage to actually put the laundry there um, without disrupting some, you know, all of the space is programmed in the buildings. Right. And right. In, in the, as Jamie said, in the Southeast Street site, it's much tighter. You know, you know, we'd have to re remove um remove a unit, remove a bedroom. I don't think we're expanding the footprints at the question at this point. Um, on on the uh, Belchertown Road site, you know, I'll leave it to Jamie or Andrew to respond. But, but the main thing is there were multiple factors and there's not like one single slam dunk. We can't do it because of this, but we're looking at, you know, the design, the maintenance, the functionality for the residents, and then on balance, you know, in some cases we just can't do it, but in other cases we think on balance it's a better decision. But let me, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jamie or Andrew. Yeah, just and that's after. yeah, and it's and it's and it's for all those it's it's for all those reasons combined, and and we just feel that 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 is able to provide the you know the best level of service for the residents as well as um, the best you know op, op, from an operation standpoint um for, for our team and that's and that's why that's why it was designed that way um you know initially and that's why we'd like to you know have it remain well the one thing I, if you haven't said that i thought you would is that it would be noisy for if, you, if you're living underneath a washing machine well well that is that is actually that is one of the things that property management oh yeah yeah no actually right Jamie, we're, we talk so much about this, is that when the machines are on the floor next to residential units, yeah. you have to restrict the hours so that somebody, it's not necessarily the top to bottom, but next door, you don't want somebody doing their laundry at midnight. Um, 
the current location of the laundry rooms, one is in the basement of Southeast Street, and the other one is in the rear first floor section of, um, uh, of the Belchertown Road property, um, which has either no or very limited adjacency to any residential units. And so we can run those. Those laundry rooms may be available 24 hours, but they're certainly not going to be limited to, you know, like 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., which you would do when you locate a laundry room next to a residential unit. I've got to say that we're we're working on about 46 buildings in New York City right now, between five stories and 21 stories tall. They all have the laundry rooms in the basement. And when I go to do my laundry in New York, I set the timer on my phone. I, I've never seen a problem. And I think the app helps a lot. If that's going to be available, that could be great. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Is, Mr. Is, there any, is there any consideration for people who may not have smartphones? Um, they're able to use the uh, the the pay kiosks and and use it, uh, you know, via a card and and pay the uh, pay the fees that that way. Okay. So pay the or, and, and you can monitor it via online as well if you have a computer. So the monitoring you'd have to, you'd have to be connected to, to 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 benefit from the monitoring. But payment is all on either card or app. It's not going to be by cash. Is that correct? You won't be put correct. Correct. You would load the card with cash with the with a kiosk machine. Okay. All right. Other questions, board members regarding the laundry. All right. On on this one, I'm I'm just I'm expecting that there might be questions next week on this again. So because two of our members aren't here, but um, I you've a, satisfied my, you've answered my questions and. Um, it may come up again next week. Um, the next item is the waiver, the request for waiving of the uh, residential bylaw waiver. Uh, and I know you've come up with a, a, a new version of your waiver request, which wouldn't exempt you from the, from the registration, but you would not have any inspections. Is, Please, uh, can you give us a, just you know, what your thought is on that and describe the, the new waiver request? Um, yep, yeah, sure. That's um, we would be um, we would be waiving the in inspection, the the five year inspection, due to the um, the the numerous other inspections that the buildings are uh, subject to um, through the. Um, you know, through the state regulatory agencies um, that's based on the funding. Um, there are, you know, there are several, um, one of them that's is the low income housing tax credit. Um, it, it's a, it's a service that is it's so that it shows that it's in compliance with EOHLC, um, the funding source that, you know, at least every three years, um, after there's a physical inspection of all buildings um, in the project, you know, and um, there's, uh, you know, 20% of the projects um, look, you know, low income or tax credit units would be inspected and the common areas um, in, in, you know, in addition to the unit inspections, there will be site ground and building exterior and common areas. Um, you know, the building systems would be physically inspected. Um, and then there's there's another also another compliance um, agency that um, our property and asset management work with um, to provide the client that that provides compliance services to EOHLC the, the, for, for some of the other state funding sources. And they they also um, inspect the units, um, the units with Section 8 and project based vouchers are inspected annually. Um, there's also um, the, you know, Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program, MRVPs are, are inspected at initial lease up. 
Um, in addition, we have inspections from our insurance, um, from some of, some of our funders, and um, and typically the uh, inspections uh, utilize the the forms, the uh, HQS um, form and checklist that I, uh, I that I, you mentioned earlier in the um, in the uh, in in the meeting in the it, it, that's a HUD um, housing quality standards uh, inspection form is what that is. So we would request a waiver from the the five year in, inspection um, due to the um, the inspections that the the buildings will already be subject to through our other um, you know regulatory requirements for compliance. Well, my my thought on this is that those all those inspections have a specific purpose. Some of them are. Um, in, are, are for funding, some of them for compliance with the, I think for compliance with the health and safety requirements. Um, but the town, the town has their own purpose for their, their inspection as well. I mean, not, I don't think HUD or anybody else is going to, is going to inspect to make sure that the building uh, comports and the site plan is being followed. The building comports with the, with the site plans. Um, there's things that the, the town requires um, for all housing that has to be um, inspected by any rental, any rental operation in the, in the city or in the town. Uh, and I have a hard time um, seeing why this rather large development rental unit shouldn't have the same inspection that any other um, large rental development would have in the town of Amherst. All those, I understand the reason for all those other inspections there that they have their own purpose, but I'm, I'm not sure why this one should be different. And I know it's, I saw your, your concern that it could cost a thousand bucks per unit, per development, per site per year to do that. And that's, I, I believe that's probably right. I, it may cost you 2000 bucks a year to do that, but you've got, you know, 70 some units. And, and I think the, my concern is that there's no, I don't see a reason. I don't think you've made a case to me, tell me that, that it's persuading me that you should not have the same compliance with the rental regulation that everybody else does. I know that the building commissioner had some problems as well with the waiver request. And um, I don't know if anybody can speak to, I'll, I'll wait for other board members to speak before I ask the staff to speak to it. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Um, well, I, the, the bylaw itself has a provision in it that, you know, suggests that, you know, um, you can request a waiver if, if the property is subject to other regulatory inspections, which, which these are. And, um, you know, any, and, and it's my understanding that any of anything that would fall under the category of something that is non-compliance Right would be report would be something reportable, and that wouldn't fall under um, you know like a waiver that would would sort of um, I guess would waive a you know a certain period of inspection. Like if there's something that is wrong, there's always an inspection that could follow that. And maybe maybe I misunderstood that, um, or the uh, you know the 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 zoning or the building commissioner would be able to speak to that. Is that if they're you know in compliance with the site plan, if for some reason that it were to fall out of compliance with the site plan, the town would still be able to inspect the property based on that complaint. But they wouldn't know that until they inspected it, unless there was a complaint from somebody who was knowledgeable about what the specifics of the site plan was and what the conditions of the special permit were and everything else. And maybe somebody is um, knowledgeable of the numerous conditions and the stuff in the site plan, but. Uh, it may not be obvious all the time, so it's the uh, you wouldn't have you wouldn't know about it unless it's some cases you wouldn't know about unless there was an inspection, whereas others you would. Um, so I'm I, I I have concerns as to Mr. Judge. So Mr. Gruber, my question is the waiver that you're asking for. Have you compared? the town's inspections to the other inspections that are done to see if there's an overlap to say, here's an overlap and here's an another reason why we're asking for a waiver.
it's it's my understanding that the um, HQS or, or housing quality standard forms are what is typically used um, by the town or by a housing authority that would ins inspect it on behalf of a municipality. So I would, I I have not seen the inspection form um, specific to the to the town to be able to compare those i mean that's something that that we could we could we could do we could certainly do and, and show the overlap um i i think that may make sense I, again i do have concerns that five years of that inspection on such large units um that seems a bit problematic if again appreciating that there's other inspections done but if the inspections are not what the town is inspecting for. That's where my concern lies. I, I would, I'd like to at least see a spreadsheet that indicate you must have a checkoff list for each one of these ins types of ins inspections. If you could, if you could take a spreadsheet and uh, give us the list of ins types of inspections to include the towns and what each one of them encompasses so that we could see what is covered and what isn't covered. Yeah. So let me see what the effect of the waiver would be on inspections. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Ehrlich has his hand raised, Mr. Chair. Oh, Mr. Ehrlich, go ahead. Oh, oh, I thought I put my hand down, but since it's still up, I'll just say, you know, again, most of the other inspections have to do with the physical quality of the living interior spaces and right. have to do with affordability compliance. So right. most of the other inspections are primarily going to be focused on what the inside of the property is like as a living environment as a, and, and on the affordability compliance. From what I'm hearing, and we will do this, this grid uh, that Mr. Meadows uh, requested, uh, you know, comparison, it's probably things like site plan. I, I believe there's already a storm order um, kind of third party monitoring that that may be involved. But my guess it's going to be primarily exterior things. But we'll do the homework on this. But there's also and the other thing is that we would look at what conditions are placed on every, on the property, and the inspection would also look to see if those conditions are being complied with. And a federal form is not a federal inspection form is probably not going to be able to pick that up. So we, that's something we do, that would be um, a difference between, I think, the, the inspections required by the town and the inspections that you probably undergo for other reasons. So that should, I look forward to the, the chart showing us what the differences are. Um, and so I, I, guess, I guess the thing to do is to somebody contact the building commissioner to understand what the scope of their inspection would be and use that as the, um, comparison to the other, other inspections, okay? Mr. Chair, may I make one more ask, and this is sure. not, of way, not of wayfinders, but um, Ms. Williams, if, if the bylaw allows us to waive the inspection, um, are there any provisions that would allow us to waive the inspection fee, given that we can waive the inspection if cost is a factor here and if we're going to say we're not on board with waiving the inspection, is there any wiggle room to waive the inspection fee? If that's something that can be reported back to the committee, that'd be helpful. I can, I, I can look into that. So you guys, I, are going to, you guys are going to come up with a. I'm just writing down the the, uh, the takeaways here. You guys are going to come up with a chart comparing inspection um, regimes, for lack of a better term. And we're going to have um, a um, statement or a, a, an analysis of whether the the, the uh, inspection fee can be waived if the if the waiver doesn't if they still comply with the rental um, regulations, right? Is that what you're asking, Mr. Yeah. Henry? Can the fee be waived even if they yes. are, they have to comply with the 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 rental? Uh, Rental residential rental provision. All right. 
Is that something we can do in a week or is that going to take some time? Ms. Fryman, I know that you've been working on this. Um, is that something you can do for next week or is that going to take a little bit of time to compare to do the comparison? Um, I believe we can do it for next week. Well, if we can, that'd, that'd be great. If not, just let us know. I mean, yeah. We'll, yeah, I don't want to let it go too long. Mr. Malloy, I see you have your hand up. Sure, thanks. Yeah, so the building commissioner still recommends not granting this waiver. And, you know, I haven't talked to Jamie or the Wayfinders team yet, but, you know, it's as you mentioned, Steve, it's, it's information that's not collected elsewhere. And so for the first five years of new construction, it doesn't get inspected. And then after that, you know, it could be on a case by case basis. But essentially, the waiver asks that they would never be subject to an inspection or a fee. And so, as has been mentioned, it could be the, the, purview of the building commissioner in later years that you know on a given year that could be waived but to grant this blanket waiver for you know the next 50 years just seem or longer is not recommended and so i, I don't i don't know if it's worth it to i mean i think a comparison is still good but i mean i think staff needs to talk about it more but the building commissioner just emailed me today and said he would not recommend this you know granting this waiver and so he he likes you know it's a simple online application you upload information, nothing has to change from year to year unless it, you know, there's something big, but it allows inspectors to go in there. And as you said, make sure conditions of the permit are being followed. Uh, it's not what other, you know, um, voucher inspections will do. It's not necessarily health and safety uh, that's covered elsewhere, but it could be, it also covers other things as part of the, the comprehensive permit. So I just, I mean, I, I think that we can talk about it with wayfinders, but really the building commissioner, this is the second time it's been asked and the second time he said he would not recommend granting it, so. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Mr. Gruber, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, it was I it was going to be in response to um the the timeline for the the comparison, but um you know uh, I'll I'll speak with our team on that as to when you know something like that if you know if and when we we would put that together. All right, just let us know. Great. So I think we've dealt with all the. The issues we wanted you to come back with for this meeting. Um, Ms. Williams, did I for, have I skipped over anything or board members, was there something else that we wanted them to respond to for this meeting before we go on to the, uh, the other things we're going to discuss? No, we had lighting, the rental bylaw waiver request, laundry facilities, and the HVAC roof configuration, and I believe we covered all of that. Yep, I think so. All right, so um, and what I'd like to, what you guys should do is let's talk about property management, then income restrictions, and then financials. And Mr. Gruber, are you going to lead the discussion on this? Yes. Yes, I am. All right. All right. Um, before you start, may I just say, I, I did not see a sample application um, in the packet. Was that oh. not provided? Because I believe I asked for one the last time. Yes. Yeah, that that was um that was that was not in the packet. We'll have that in the packet for um for next week when um we talk about the tenant selection process and um in 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 that is that is that okay? My Thank you. That it wasn't that didn't make it into the packet this week. I will share my screen. Sample application. So, Mr. Gruber, if we're going to read along with um, what your application is, should we be looking at the um, management plan narrative that you sent into our uh, put in our pack that you submitted? Is that what we should be looking at here? Um, yeah, you're. Yep, you could okay. you could look at the uh, the management plan narrative. It's going to be you know an an, an overview, I guess you know of that, and um and and these are going to be the you know the main main points of that for the property management plan. So right. just right. to yep. So you all can see my uh, see my mm -hmm. screen. Okay, great. We'll start then. Um, yeah, so Wayfinders professionally manages over 800 affordable rental home units in communities across uh, Western and Central Massachusetts. 
uh, primarily in Western Mass. Um, we have a portfolio of properties that you know address the needs of specific demographics like older adults, low-income families, and people with disabilities. Um, we offer a range of apartment options from single room occupancy to four bedroom apartments. Our property and uh, management uh, residential service team work closely to create you know, a positive and productive uh, environment um, in relationships with our residents. Um, it's a, uh, we try to promote a sense of community through social activities, workshops, meetings, and services at each site. Um, Wayfinders will have a part-time on-site property manager um, and uh, maintenance personnel um, and a resident service coordinator, um, a part-time resident service coordinator. Emergencies will be responded to by maintenance personnel and residents will be able to contact maintenance after posted office hours through a 24 hour, seven day, um, you know, answering service um, to um, to to be connected with the, the, the appropriate person. Um, we'll also have a part time resident service coordinator for the development. The resident service coordinator will they'll meet with new residents upon intake, offer and meet. Um, with existing residents on an ongoing basis and orientate them on the property and um, assess their service needs. Um, they'll provide uh, information and referral to tenants to um, organize resident community activities and educational activities or support groups and uh, maintain um, you know information on those um, on those those activities. Um, they'll also serve as a liaison for other programs such as financial literacy and uh, first-time homebuyer classes or career counseling, income tax preparation. They'll just help out with, um, with, 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 a, with a wide range of items. Um, so we'll have that um, at our properties, you know, and each property has a, a, an, an office on the lower level um, each Office will, I, I mean, each property will also have a community room for residents to to use, and they'll they'll be they would be able to reserve that room for you know a birthday party or if they had a you know a larger gathering that, that they wanted to have, um, they'd be able to reserve that room and use that. Um, at the sites, we're going to provide um, trash and recycling through uh, you know a single stream recycling um, through two dumpsters that um, will be emptied uh, you know, either weekly or bi-weekly, depending on um, the, the, the waste hauler. Um, our landscaping and maintenance that'll be provided by um, contractors that, that will hire to maintain the sites. And um, we discussed the snow removal with our engineers um, and um, determined that, you know, up, there, there was there was capacity for snow storage and that you know any excess snow would be um, trucked off site um, you know for as an as needed um, basis. And, uh, yeah, and that's you know we so, so tell me um, in your experience, how many hours a week will there be either a site manager or a Somebody other than than like a building engineer, but uh, somebody a site manager on 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 site. How many hours per week would that be? Because I I know it's it's not a full time presence. It's not a forty hours a week situation. Yeah, and um, um, I'd like to just ask uh, Amanda, would you be able to to speak to that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm Amanda Bubon. I'm the vice president of compliance um, for the property and asset management department at Wayfinders, uh, working mostly out of the Springfield office. Um, so for site staffing, uh, depending on how many properties that the manager, and it's usually a team, a manager with a, an assistant property manager, um, they'll manage like several sites together. But typically there would be on-site office hours at least four days out of the week. Um, whether it's the assistant that's there or the property managers that's there, they'll they'll share the coverage um, as well as the um, resident service coordinator would have certain on-site office hours that may be the same time as the assistant or the property manager, or we may set it up where they're there for office hours on days that we're not so that there's still always someone available. Uh, typically, 
within our department, Wednesdays is the only day of the week that we don't have like normal standing office hours at the properties. It's by appointment only on those days. And those are the days that we use for administrative, you know, paperwork, catch up, filing um, and things like that, rather than just having the door open all day. But we will still allow people to make appointments. So it's Wednesday, you said. That's one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like we don't normally have like regular open post office hours on Wednesdays. Uh, but if tenants need us for something, we are still available to them. They'll have our contacts, our emails, phone numbers. Um, and also if, if that's the only day they can come in to do paperwork or to meet with us or something like that, we'll accommodate those appointments for them as well. And are you there on weekends as well? Uh, not typically on the weekends for admin staff, unless it's a busy time with paperwork. Uh, we do have managers that are absolutely willing to meet with tenants on weekends. Like if they work all week and they just can't get into the office, we'll kind of rearrange our schedules a little bit to make ourselves available for them. Uh, in terms of maintenance, though, maintenance is available 24-7, 365 days a year. So if there's any kind of emergency that happens, um, even with like sometimes like police department calls or the fire department or something like that happens over the weekend. Uh, we do have on-call coverage, both with the maintenance and with administrative staff as well. There's a rotation with the property managers and the regional property managers to cover any kind of administrative things that come up. Is your, is your maintenance team on site? Yeah, they would have dedicated on-site hours during the week. And then and then the 24-7 coverage is like a rotation of a team. So there'll be, uh, what we do now is you have dedicated maintenance technicians for a portfolio of maybe two, three properties, uh, usually two or three techs that, that rotate between those properties regularly to do cleanup, you know, walking grounds every day, picking up the trash, handling any regular routine maintenance items, preventative maintenance items. And then if there's emergencies that come up, um, we have it structured on call. So even if it's not a day that there would be a tech there doing regular work, there would be a tech available to come uh, right away And if there was an emergency or something needed to be addressed that day. So uh, the question was, uh, but what I understand your answer is that there's likely to be people on site Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and sometimes on the weekends if, if need be, if there's a particular need for it, you can make an appointment. Yeah. Um, but I want I want to know how many ballpark you guys manage this, you know how how much you Yeah, do. I would say how at least people, 30 hours a week. How yeah. Many? Yeah, I would say at least 30 hours a week there okay. would be an administrative person in the office. And also from your experience, um, not having people there on the weekends or at night. Is, have you found that there is either a need, uh, complaints, conflicts, any, do you feel that, that you have sufficient coverage for um, these larger units, these larger number of units, not to have people there at night or on the week, all, all the time on the weekends? Have you found that there's been a problem not having people there, um, management on the weekends? And the yeah, nights? I would say overall, we don't seem to have a lot of issues with that. Um, you know, we have a very diverse, portfolio uh, and we serve a lot of different um, tenants so we do have some properties where you know the the weekend and the night uh you know sometimes can be an issue um and typically we hire third-party security to do walkthroughs if there's any kind of you know if there's any kind of concern about like noise or excessive guests or partying or you know things that are happening because there isn't a management presence there uh sure. we would we would look into that uh different types of security contracts to be on site doing walkthroughs either during the day on the weekends during the night on the weekends um, but that's really not it's not standard it's not something we have to do everywhere it's really an as needed thing and and sometimes that does happen based on the the demographic of the populations at the properties so um it is something that we do if we if we need to do if you get if you get complaints from tenants it's something that you that can be done that's what you're yeah. saying yeah Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Other questions regarding the management plan? Who's, and uh, the one question we did have was on snow removal, that there was limited places to push snow, especially on Southeast Street. Um, is it correct that in, if you have a large snow, we were talking about this last week, we had like over 10 inches, I think is what you said, 
you probably wouldn't be able to to have it all on site. Do you have a will you have a contract specifically to remove that off that snow off site so that the the uh, parking areas and the uh, um, would be cleared? Yes. You do. Okay. Well, th that's what that's what we we would have. Yes. We would have. All yes. right. Yeah, we do usually include that in our snow removal contracts with the when we when we sign them. We include provisions for all of that. It'll talk about here's your rate up to this many inches. After this many inches, they're going to come and plow. It's very specific. And in sites where we do have, because we have other sites too, that very limited snow storage space. Um, so we make sure to include what their fees are going to be for the equipment needed for, for trucking offsite. So we would definitely make sure that's going to be in the contract where it's a concern. Great. All right. The only question I have, I mean, I think you've answered, you've given me an indication of what your, um, how you typically respond, but in this development, we're going to have a lot of working families and, and maybe single parent working, working parents. And it's going to, if they have questions, if they have forms to fill out, if they have, um, a need to speak to somebody, it's going to be, for many of them, it's going to be outside normal working hours, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I would just encourage you to make sure that how, what you've represented here is ex indeed your policy, that you are flexible and would make, your, make the residential site management team available to working families who can't do it from nine to five. And, on the week, uh, on weekdays. I think that'd be important. Yeah, yeah. And as a general practice, we operate that way. So um, it's not uncommon for us to get calls from tenants late in the evening hours on the weekends. Um, I've, I've actually myself been out of operations for some time and working mainly in compliance. Um, but I still have tenants that will call me on the weekend if they need something, if you know, just because it's a phone number that they have. Uh, and if they're trying to call somebody and they can't get somebody, they they know how to reach someone within our department. Um, and then if even if it was something administrative, they still have the ability to call in to our 24-7 answering service. Um, and those calls all get forwarded to our um, emails and everything like that. So the managers are regularly getting um any information that's coming in from from the tenants but we yeah we do accommodate um especially it's helpful to us even in in getting our paperwork done and doing what we have to do to be able to accommodate them uh because if they can't make it in during normal hours or or during the weekday and we need them to complete their paperwork or you know we need to meet with them about something it's conducive to us just as much as it's beneficial to them to to be flexible that way okay thank you I don't have any other questions on property management. Uh, either Mr. Meadows or Mr. Henry, do you have questions or, or Ms. Williams or, or Mr. Malloy? Okay, let's move on to um, income restrictions then. Okay, great. Right. So I'll, I'll start this out and just say that, you know, the income restrictions in the affordable housing, they're all based upon area median income levels or AMI. So that's what that um, acronym is. And uh, they, they may be familiar with some of you, but the income limits are updated by HUD each year and uh, vary depending on geographic location. Um, these are the limits for the Springfield HUD metro area that includes Amherst. Um, so uh, currently, like for an example, 60% um, uh, AMI for a family of four would be $65,700 a year. So anything lower than that, you know, family earning up to that would, um, would fall into that category. Um, so currently... You know, a four person, hundred percent AMI is is roughly a hundred and you know nine nine thousand um, dollars, and one person um, would be like around seventy six thousand for a hundred percent AMI. And these are the other, um, you know, uh, the numbers that um, would the categories would be split up by, and then market rate would just be unrestricted. Yeah. Um, and then the rent tiers that we would expect to see. 
um, you know, now calculated, um, w w including um, heat and, and um, air conditioning, electric and, and hot water is all included in this. And so, for example, a, um, you know, a two, a three bedroom unit uh, at 60% AMI would be rented for roughly $1,700 a, you know, $1,707 a, a, a month. And these are all, you know, they're all subject to, to change. They get, they get adjusted a little bit, um, you know, each, each year um, through uh, HUD. And then these are some of the other examples, like an 80% AMI unit, three bedroom unit would be um, $2,276. And um, so, and then our markets, um, rates were um you know a little bit below what the what the um like a, a market analysis showed and where we would probably rent those for or you know in the same kind of uh range and um ratio to the 80 percent AMI so so now I'll talk a little bit about the uh you know apartment income mix across both sites is is shown shown here um, and, you know, um, approximately 68 of the 78% of the, um, units will be income restricted units while the remaining 10 will be, um, reserved for market rate. Um, the income mix unit and bedroom counts were largely driven by the town's goals, um, that were set, um, through the RFP process, um, to develop the sites, um, you know, in, in, you know, the sites, the, it, those goals also closely align with the state's um, EOHLC's goals and criteria for selecting and funding a, a development. So it kind of, you know, it, 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 it meets, um, you know, both of those criteria. You know, the RFP requested a minimum of, um, you know, 13% of the units for 30% uh, AMI or less, and the development um, provides, you know, roughly 29% or 23 units at this level. Um, the RFP stated that a minimum of um, 40 units at 60% AMI or lower, and we have, um, you know, roughly uh, 49, 49 units here um, at 60% uh, AMI or lower. So, um, you know, it's 62% um, the units would be that. And then um, as the RFP, all the, all the units um, are at or below 80% AMI at the Belcher Town Road site, which is consistent with um, the town's RFP. And, um, and, it's, and it's due largely because the, the, the property was um, purchased with the CPA um, dollars that were, you know, for the affordable housing. So it comes with that restriction. Um, the RFP also strongly encouraged the 80% AMI, some also referred to as uh, workforce housing and market rate units. And, you know, Wayfinders understands the benefits of a mixed income development and include and included, um, you know, 19 80% AMI units and uh, 10, 10 market rate units. And the 10 market rate units would be at um, Southeast Street. So, um, you know, the RFP also requested that the, you know, it's design conforms to EOHLC design guidelines at the state, which it does. And um, the RFP also set a mix of, of bedroom goals um, for, you know, between one and three bedroom units. The RFP uh, wanted, you know, stated to have 66% of the units to be two or, or more bedrooms. And we have um, roughly 68% uh, um, of the units are um, two, two and three bedroom units. So 38 of them are two bedrooms and we have 15 three bedroom units are provided um, throughout the development. And then the RFP also required that a minimum of 10% of the three bedrooms are, would be three bedroom units in 19, and we have 15 of those, which you know equates to around 19% of the units are three bedrooms. So that's generally how the um, 
the the income you know the income levels and the um in in how they 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 work together um in this development to to meet the goals of the R to meet the goals of the town and the RFP and the affordability that also align with um you know the state's criteria um, um for these these types of developments um and now I can show like so at thirty one Southeast Street you know we have we have uh, ten you know, 10 one bedrooms and one one studio that we were um, able to fit in and, uh, you know, 15 two bedrooms and five three bedroom units, total of 31 units. And then at 70 Belcher Town Road, we have 47 units. We have 10 three bedrooms, 23 two bedrooms and 12 um, one bedrooms with two studios and a mix of uh, affordability. Um, levels shown there. So, and those are the unit unit and affordability kind of matrices for um, the the development. Are there any questions? Can you go back to the uh, apartment income mix chart mm -hmm. that had both both mm -hmm. sides? Yeah, there we go. So um, I was unaware until now that much of this. The mix of both income and bed number of bedrooms was a requirement of the RFP that the town put out. I was prepared to tell you that I was really impressed with the fact that you had that Wayfinders had come up with a way to create um, to provide almost thirty percent of these units for people making thirty percent or less of AMI. Um, I'm still impressed with it. I'm still I think it's a really important thing, and it's it's forgotten a lot. We just look at eighty percent or fifty percent of median income and we don't focus on how on the people that are really going to have a hard the hardest time trying to find housing and i have to say that i'm very impressed that you have close to you have close to 40 percent of your of the housing underneath at 50 percent or less and indeed you have 30 percent at 30 percent ami or less i mean, know oh, they're heavily subsidized but it's a part of the market that just isn't it, it isn't it isn't served well, and I'm very, I'm really happy that this, these two sites, have put so much uh, into 30% and below of AMI. So, congratulations on doing that and getting the kind of funding that allows you to to subsidize those units. And I also think it's not that it's great that you have so many three bedroom units for 30% and below because you have a lot of low income families that need it, and I'm. I'm, I'm, I am really um, happy to see that. I'm impressed. So this is great in terms of the, the mix. Thank you. Can we go back to the, um, can we go back to the rental? Uh, the, 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 you had a chart on rent. Yeah, what it costs them. So for a 30%, so I know it's 30% of the resident income um for each for the under 30 percent and that varies right but um if, I, if i'm correct it's about for one person it's about twenty thousand dollars to be at the 30 ami in amherst is that correct twenty three thousand yeah. dollars okay. so two thousand dollars a month so for somebody in that income a single person in that income uh at, at so 24 that let's call it 24 two thousand a month 30% of that is $600 a month. So they're, they would be getting a, a studio apartment for $600, $600 a month as a single person. Is that about right? Including utilities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, uh, yeah, that would be right if, if they were at like right, right. at the income. Right at the top. Right? Right at the top. Yeah, yeah, because if they're, if their income's only Three hundred dollars a month, right? We have single individuals on like um, emergency assistance through Department of Transitional Assistance, where their income is like three hundred dollars a month. So that that person would only pay a hundred dollars yeah. a month. Right. And the other thing that goes into that too, for um, you know, for individuals that are uh, elderly or disabled, or individual uh, families that have children, there's deductions for certain things when you when their rent gets calculated like their medical payments their prescription costs child care costs and things like that so 
it's it's thirty percent of their adjusted income, not thirty percent of their gross income when they have those uh, project based subsidies. Yeah. Well, I think the the mix is um, really good, and uh, I think you're doing a it's, the, the town evidently and and you guys have done have complied with that, done a good job of targeting where the, I think where the a real need in this town, and so I'm I'm impressed. Um, other other questions? I, I have one more before I open it up, I guess. So always, you know, when somebody is successful, they're, they're in at 50% AMI, they get a raise, they make more money, or they have fewer deductions, whatever it is, but their adjusted income changes. Uh, and they, do, does the rent automatically increase um, at, with their, so that when they fit into 60% AMI, what do you do when, what do you do to adjust for people who are still under 80% of AMI, but their income varies over time, and maybe their income goes up some years or it goes down. How do you how do you work that out in, in your um, in the, each of these each of these buildings? Um, so with the 30% AMI units, those are going to have project based rental assistance. So while they're living in those units as their income goes up or goes down, they would get like interim rent adjustments. They would provide their paperwork to the subsidy provider um, and, and they would recalculate what their tenant share should be. For the other units at you know the 50%, 60%, 80% levels, there's not a subsidy attached there. Um, often we'll get um, applicants and tenants moving in that have like mobile vouchers, mobile subsidy vouchers. So they would be able to go to their uh, voucher administrator and ask for a rent change. For uh, those that don't have a project-based or a tenant-based subsidy, the, the rents are set each year and it's a calculation based on the income limit adjusted for like bedroom size. Um, and that's like the max rents that we can charge uh, it, at a property like this where all utilities are included, that would be the rent charge. So unfortunately, if they're living in a 60% unit, um, which, you know, a straight tax credit unit, they don't have a subsidy, it's not project-based subsidized, they would still have to pay the rent if they lost their job. Um, so, you know, we do work with them in, in times of transition between jobs and things like that. We'll refer them to the RAF department, uh, for assistance or other community resources to help them, um, pay their rent in the short term, uh, while they're looking for work. But one of the things you've done is you have a specific mix of income, of income categories throughout these units. And if people's income changes while they're in a unit, does it affect the, um, it affects the, the mixture then your distribution of incomes per you for the units and how do you account how do you account for that i guess i'm not asking the question very so clearly. okay so Here. maybe i think if i explain a little bit how these programs work regulatory wise uh it might help answer your question um, i'll do my best so with uh, programs like the workforce program the tax credit program uh home funding um, which is usually where that 50% of AMI comes in uh, as a source. Um, with those, so once they're eligible, once they're certified as eligible for the unit and they move into the unit, they're always considered eligible at that level. So they're allowed to they're allowed to exceed the income limit in their unit for that for that because they're once they're eligible, they're always eligible for their lifetime. So where it comes into play is if we had someone, uh, you know, when we have market units in, in question here, if we had someone that was residing in one of the tax credit units or the workforce units and their income exceeded 140% of the income limit for their household size when they did a recertification, then we would have to look to make the next available unit as a move in at that income restricted levels so that you always have a minimum, you're always meeting what your minimum fraction is, right? We have to have a certain number of units at certain income levels all the time. But the second that they are certified eligible and they move into the property, they're always eligible at that level, even if their income exceeds the income limit 
even if they went over the 140% of the income limit, they would still stay in that unit and be considered affordable as long as management follows those next available unit rules for the overall development. Um, if they were in a situation, and we've had this at other properties where, you know, they're, they're living in a market unit um, and, and now they're eligible for affordable unit or they're in an 80% unit or a 60% unit and now they become eligible for, you know, like a 30% unit with a subsidy or something like that. We do handle internally adding them to our waiting lists and things like that so that as soon as something comes up and they're the next in line, we would get them into a, a lesser income category unit that they were eligible for. We would rescreen them for that unit, determine that they're eligible for that, and then move them into the, the lower category with a lesser rent. Because obviously, each time you bump up an income category, the rent goes up as well because the rents are set based mm -hmm. on the income limits themselves. Does that help maybe? It does help, but it's, it's okay. really complicated. It is very, very it's, complicated. I mean, I, it's really complicated to try to make sure that you, you meet your income mix that you that you promised. Yeah. And, and because people's income is going to change. And then they're, I didn't realize this, but they're permitted to, they're qualified for life even yeah. if their income changes. Um, so it's, that's just the way the state program works, evidently. It I'll, is. I'll just add, I think Amanda did a great it, job. Yeah. <laughs> this is a really, really complicated part yeah. about the tax credit program because, and for really any affordable program, nobody's going to get evicted because they're making too much money. That's ridiculous. You know, everybody should be encouraged, entitled to make right. more money without being evicted. Okay. So, and sometimes people lose income also, you know, and so it, it, the programs are designed to to respect that flexibility, okay, in people's lives, their incomes, and it doesn't put us out of compliance. But then there's another set of rules that say when units become available or what, you know, there's always a reversion to try to bring it back. If there's new units that are available, they have to get filled to bring it back closer to the original Right. compliance standard um you know and so th so that that's a that's constant work and amanda and her group in compliance are always doing this balancing act of you know people's incomes going up going down keeping the ratios we have to have a certain percentage of units available at certain incomes in order to re remain in compliance yeah yeah it is really complicated and you don't want to penalize somebody for success, right? You don't want to penalize somebody who's up, who's um, done well and is, is now earning more money than they did when they first started. That's, I can, I, we totally understand that. Okay. Um, questions from board members regarding um, income restrictions. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Henry. No, no questions. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, the, the only thing that confused me, you're not really moving people. A uh, two-bedroom unit is a two-bedroom unit. A three-bedroom unit is a three-bedroom unit. You're, you're not going to move them from one unit to another. You're just categorizing the unit as something different than it was before, but it's still the same unit, correct? Yeah, we do have the flexibility um, for remapping units over time, right? So, uh, you know, a unit may start out as a market unit, and then later on, it may be designated as a 60% unit because a tenant currently living in a 60% unit may have gone over that 140% of the AMI for their household. Um, so we do monitor that regularly, and we do have to move things around. And the designations aren't fixed to specific units. It's it's specific to the whole property, the mix that you have. Uh, the only time that uh, there's units that are really fixed, um, and even then we do have the ability to ask for amendments, is the subsidized units. So when we enter the contracts for project-based um, you know, uh, mass rental voucher program, which is the MRVP program or the project-based Section 8 program, uh, those units are specifically designated when the contract is entered between the authority and the in the property. Um, if we ended up in a situation where 
there was a tenant living in a subsidized unit whose income, you know, uh, gradually over time exceeds the, uh, not necessarily the income limit, but exceeds their need for rental assistance where they're now paying the 30% of their adjusted income is the full rent for the unit. Uh, we would be able to work with the housing authority or the Section 8 administrator um, to ask for an amendment to swap it to another unit. And we would analyze, see if we have a vacant unit uh, that might have opened that we could move the subsidy to. Um, and then we do try sometimes to try to work through if we had a current tenant in the population um, that may be in need of that subsidy and someone else no longer needed it to try to be able to allocate that subsidy to that that individual within the property in the case that there wasn't any vacants that we could move it to. Okay. So you do work with the local housing authority on the section eight units? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, uh, usually with our project-based section eight contracts, um, we work with Wayfinders Rental Assistance for administration of those. Uh, that's the, the you know, the rental assistance department within Wayfinders that administers those type of contracts. Anything that's project-based MRVP, um, we work with another regional housing authority because there's uh, regulations that don't allow us to administer those programs when we have a, a stake in ownership of the entity. So uh, there's different different parts of it, right? Even with Section 8 managing uh, through Wayfinders with the contracts, there's certain pieces of that administration that are outsourced to third parties because of conflict of interest. So if we're using Wayfinders as a housing authority for the project-based Section 8 contract, all the inspections and the rent comparison analysis would be done by an outside agency to make sure that it's it's you know fair and equitable and that it's not you know that there's no conflict to the data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. If there's no further comments or questions um, on income restrictions, let's go to the financials of the project. And I guess that's the last topic we have for tonight. I normally we we break at seven thirty. I think that there's no reason to break at 7.30, but let's just do this next subject matter and we'll continue to plow through um, and hopefully you'll be done um, before 8.30 or tonight. So we'll, we'll continue through and not take our traditional 7.30 break. Let's do financials. Okay, well, so most the, the development is, is primarily going to be um, funded through low income housing tax credits um, that are administered through the executive office of housing and livable communities and um, other uh, available state subsidies um, for this, this development. Um, there's a, a funding round application that typically happens, you know, annually with with other um, funding application rounds um, that 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 um, you know, you, you're invited to based on um, how well you meet the criteria that the um, state designates, um, you know, for the, the, the competition. So, and, and that's primarily how these affordable housing developments are, are funded through, through that, that way. So, and Bruce, if there's anything you'd like to add to the. Yeah, I'll just. Um, a little bit here, you know, so as, you know, we talked about the income mix, which is very much uh, a marriage of both local preferences, local needs, and state policy as well. They happen to coincide very well in this project, um, and it sort of meets Wayfinder's sort of interests as well as the developer and owner of this property to have this income mix. We are then you know, those, that mix of incomes um, that we have opens up various funding opportunities. You know, we're going to be, we expect to be tapping um, tax exempt bond financing, for example, for this project. Um, that tax exempt bond financing um, should open up what are called 4% federal tax credits. There are 9% credits and there are 4%. This isn't the time to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, we expect to be using bond financing, 4% tax credits, um, 
state tax credits. There are state low-income housing tax credits and federal. So the 4% are federal credits. There'll be state low-income housing tax credits that run pretty much parallel to the, to the federal credits. And then we will also be applying for a lot, like seven, eight figures of uh, what we call soft debt from EOHLC. They've got a whole you know, uh, list of potential funding sources. Uh, some of them are very flexible. This is for any housing below 60% of AMI. Some of their funding is available, available for any, for units of 80 to 100%. Some of their funding is specifically targeted for people um, with special needs, maybe they're clients of the Department of Mental Health, for example, or they're for people um, who are handi handicapped and physical disabilities. And so they have all these, a vast array of buckets of money to, you know, help subsidize the construction of these units, whether they're low income or meeting the needs of certain populations. And part of what we do and we hope to do later this winter is submit our first application to the state um, for this array of funds. Um, and then the last piece is also the permanent mortgage financing. You know, there will be a lot of subsidized uh, low income, uh, low interest debt, zero interest debt, debt and tax credit equity, we call it. Um, the project will also support a permanent loan, which is going to be based on the resulting net operating income you know this you know all of these rents minus the expenses you know in all real estate that will have net operating income that will support a certain amount of uh of private uh mortgage financing as well so you know we have an idea right now of of what that's that financing stack is going to look like um it's too early to say exactly how many tax credits and how many of this source and how many of that source. But, you know, part of our job and we work very closely with um, EOHLC is to figure out really what is the best mix of available funds to make this project work. Um, so, you know, we, we, we don't have a certain mix that we could show you now because we haven't financed this project. In fact, once we complete this zoning process, that really gives us the green light to, to submit an application to EOHLC um, because there's a lot of physical and, and social characteristics of this property that are designed to meet state policy. Um, but a threshold for even submitting an application is you need to be substantially through your zoning process and with sort of light at the end of the tunnel, at least, you know. Um, so which I think we're <laughs> we're substantially through. I don't know. I don't know how close we are to the end of the tunnel, but they don't want to, you know, given how long zoning processes can take in many places, you know, they're they're not going to look at projects that are not, you know, well into the zoning process. So, you know, that's why we're doing this now. And we hope to submit an application uh this winter for our first round of state financing. So it's a very general answer. We can't give you do dollars of this and dollars of that. Um, but that's how we approach this. Well, you, you, I understand. I know these things change, and this is a it's a estimate what you, what you gave in your application. But yeah. I was looking through it, and I just had some questions, knowing that this can change, knowing that this is your your first blush approach to your finances. But mm -hmm. I don't understand, and this is for my benefit. I'm not sure I understand how tax credit equity works. Is this something that you then, is there a secondary market for tax credits that you can then, you will get them, you will sell your tax credit to some en some taxable entity, they will give you the cash for that, you'll use that for the construction costs? Is that how this works? More or less, but... <laughs> more or less. <laughs> more or less. I know it couldn't be that simple. But of course, it's a little more complicated. Yeah, it can't so it I'll, be. I'll go, and there's two basic buckets of tax credits, state and federal. Um, the state credits are the simplest to describe, okay? We, the state credit, once we establish and, and demonstrate we've achieved, we've met the affordability goals, the state, uh, the Department of Revenue will issue a certificate that, that allocates tax credits to this project. We then will sell those to a, a corporation that's a Massachusetts taxpayer 
we'll we'll get we'll get uh for five years we'll get the state tax credits come across five years we'll have an agreement to sell those credits to a massachusetts taxpayer a corporation paying state income taxes and and they'll pay us you know a percentage of that because it's present valued it's over five years so if we get uh you know if we get 12 million in state credits you know net present value might be like 10 million okay so that's how that works that's a very simple transaction is we're just trading a piece of paper really yeah. the federal tax credits are more complicated we create a limited partnership in order for the federal investor a tax credit investor to benefit from the tax credits they need to be invested in the property in the ownership structure we create a limited partnership the federal investor becomes the 99.9% .9 owner for a period of 15 years okay which is the period because the tax federal credits come out 1 15th for 15 years the federal credit the project will then deliver 99.9% .9 of the annual federal credits go to the limited partner, the investor. The investor will also get the depreciation losses, essentially. So the investors for 15 years are getting tax benefits. They're not getting a share of cash flow. They're not owning and they're not Control not controlling, the property. Not controlling the company. No, Wayfinders is yep. going to be the managing member. We are yep. going to entirely control. I mean, if we if there's malfeasance and we're failing and all that, the limited partners are allowed to step in and kick us out. But that's right. not going to happen. Uh, but basically, they are a passive investor for mm -hmm. 15 years to get the tax benefits, and then they leave quietly at the end of 15 years. So, um, and they've gotten all their benefits, and and we've gotten all their cash. Yeah. And that's it. Simple. Well, in concept, simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In concept, simple. All right. So I, I mean, I, I understand that this is all going to change. It all depends on interest rates. It all depends on what the bond rate is, all that. I, I guess what I feel is my responsibility is to, at the end of this process, feel that you have a plan that's going to work, that's financially um feasible it's not it's not you're not going to come back in two years and say jesus just isn't going to work we have to we're not just we have to turn the property back to the city or back to the town or whatever it is so uh, and obviously this what i have before me what you submitted is just the first attempt at that pro forma okay but what is it that what's the risk the biggest risk to this project being financially successful what would we, what do you worry about that would, would not work, what, it would happen that would not make this work on, on a financial basis? Is there anything out there? The federal programs are probably gonna stay. Interest rates could skyrocket and that may cause, but thank God they seem to be going down. Mm -hmm. Just walk me through, is there something that we should all be, something that we should be aware of? Because okay. I can't go through all these numbers and no, no, no. And, and, Second guess them because you're the experts. I'm not. No, and I, I can I can answer that because there's actually two experiences in all of our lifetime where we've been through crisis events. Um, yep. So the first thing I'll say is everything you've seen in this draft pro forma is based on you know our collective experience, knowing what things cost, <laughs> how much income we're going to get, what all the regulations are, what kind of financing the state's likely to give us, and so we're comfortable with this as a working model. Things happen. What happened? So the most recent one, these are real examples that Wayfinders experienced in the last five years. Oh, once in a century pandemic comes around. Whoa. OK, supply chain, construction costs. We're about to start construction and construction costs go up 20 oh, percent. Oh, then. OK, we've settled that. We think we've flatten that out. We've got some additional funding. Our tax credit investor on a project gave us more equity. The state gave us more tax credits. Everything's nice. And then interest rates spiked, you know, because the interest rate increase and the inflation increase really followed the supply chain problems by about a year. So we have two projects in our pipeline that we thought were ready to go into construction about two or three years ago. And they went right into this vortex. 
we only got those two projects funded this year, once in Holyoke, once in South Adley. And uh, we expect to close in, uh, in early 2025. And so we had to go back to the state. We worked really hard to get in, an investor that would give us top dollar. In other words, the best return on the tax credit sale, I'll call it. Um, and we think we're there. We're not 100% there, but we're really close. Another example, the financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9, okay, wiped out the tax credit market because most of the tax credit investors had no profits. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two largest investors in the market, left the market completely. The tax credit market was dead. Federal government, the Treasury Department, monetized those credits. And so for about a two-year period, they took the dollar value of the tax credits and they turned them into what were basically tax certificates and it, or cash virtually. Okay, so the federal government turned the, the, the value of the tax credits into cash in order to keep projects moving during the 2008, 2009 crisis. So we don't always know the state is there gonna bail, bail us out. We don't know that the federal government can always be so responsive, but during both of those crises, and I think everybody here, most of us remember those, the tax credit and affordable housing market kept moving forward. Slower problems to be solved, but it wasn't like the commercial market, which just had the rug pulled out and parts of the commercial market were just killed in especially 15 years ago. Um, so there's a lot of public support. And I think that's really the risk mitigant. You know, there was a big state housing bond bill that just passed a couple of months ago for, I think it's a five million, four million dollar, four billion dollar authorization over the next five year period. So there's a lot of public support. We have our job to do <laughs> to make sure we sharpen the pencils, we design it right, we use, we use sound assumptions, but the state and federal partners are, you know, that's what it's all about. And they have to be confident in us also. Obviously, you know, if we're screwing around and we don't know what we're doing, you know, we're not, we're, they're not going to save our project. Um, right. Okay. Thank you. What other questions regarding the financials of the, the project? I had one other thing I wanted to just bring up. It's not specifically, it's something that I, in reading through the material, I saw, which just, uh, I think is really enlightening. And it was the um, market analysis of rents in Amherst uh, that was done, that you contracted um, with a firm to do and I'm looking for it here, and I thought I had, I had marked it, but the the uh, sticky came off. Um, are you? <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? The chart that the chart that um, shows the market, the the current market in Amherst for one, two, three, and four one, one two, studio one and two and three bedroom apartments. It's in. Is it in six? I'm sorry, I. My post-it note dropped off and now I can't find it, which is, of course, what happens. I think it's really interesting for um, all of us on the board there. Uh, yeah, is that it? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, what, what section is that of your, of your proposal to us? Mr. Brewer, do you know? It says Exhibit and, 8, yeah, Mr. Chair. Exhibit 8, great. There we are. I just think if this is, there we go, that's it. Market rent comparison report. I think writing through this, I it, it took my breath away at the, the market rate for uh, property in our area and that how substantially lower you are. And in this case, that the, um, the square footage in many cases is higher than it would be for the market. But look at the look at the, the market rate for oh, where is it was the net is it the gross rent 
for one, two, and three bedrooms between $1,300 for a, I'm sorry, I'm trying. Yeah, $1,300 for a studio property and a three bedroom market, excuse me, $1,700 market average for a studio in Amherst and a $3,700 market rate for a three, a three bedroom apartment in Amherst. Am I reading that correctly? Is that what your, your um, analysis? We have right remainder of a fruit fair. Sure. What's that? It's thirty seven hundred bucks for a for a three bedroom apartment in Amherst. That's that's what that yeah, that's what the table shows in the thirty uh twenty-nine thirty-eight for a two bedroom. Imagine student housing is captured in this, like not on campus housing, but like apartments that target student rentals. Well, these are comparable. So if you, if you, you know, go so to these table, are going to be. Oh, sorry, Jamie. Um, go yeah, ahead. If if you go to table tw uh, fourteen, which is on uh, PDF page twelve. In that, it 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 gives you the breakdown of the three bedroom. Um, comparable rents. Oh, these are specific projects mm -hmm. and properties. Yeah. And so what I was going to say, it, these aren't any student apartments. The, the, compar the comparable properties are professionally managed properties. They're adjusted for whether or not utilities are included. So um, you know, a lot of older properties, you know, historically you pay your utilities. So, uh, you know, the if you're living in an older three or six unit building and you're paying your own utilities and your windows rattle, you're not paying these rents as a student. If you're living in a professionally managed property um, that's of, you know, in of good quality and your utilities are all provided, you know, so the market analysis adjusts, you know, like an appraisal would for what is a comparable unit. It's not every unit is comparable. So your your universe of comparison is large, um, quote unquote, well managed developments projects. It's, it doesn't include the um, single family home that's rented out or the two duplexes on the street. Is that what you're telling me? Exactly. Okay. So this is for professionally managed, for lack of a better term, large developments. And that's the universe that, that you're comparing to. Okay. Generally, it's the market analyst did this, yep. but that's how it's. All right. Well, that's helpful because I was, I almost um, I gasped when I saw that and not realizing that the, uh, what the universe of comparison was. Okay. It's not to say that some of these larger developments don't have market rate that rent to students because they could they could sure but it's but it's not the, the um it's not the the duplex where one person no. owns a house and they rent it out to correct not the second part of the duplex to four students that's correct. not included here. okay which is a large part of the amherst market market yeah. correct. okay all right are there other questions, comments that members of the board have for the applicant? Not at this time, Mr. Chair. Great. All right. Um, so for next next time, we've got um, a few things you're going to try to come back with. Um, you're going to look. Mr. Um, Meadows had some questions regarding runs to the terminal units, and you're going to if you if that's a, if you can get that done by. Our next meeting, which is next week, is it not, Ms. Williams? Yeah. Next week. That's correct. Okay. Um, the chart, we have a, a chart comparing, what's the second? I, my notes just have a chart comparing. Inspection report. Inspection, inspection report. 
That's right. It's, I have it pulled up for you to read if you'd like to read it. Oh, already? Right. My goodness. Thank you. Um, exact length from runs, rental app, the rental application that Mr. Henry had asked about speak to neighboring properties about the effects of the lighting and spill onto their properties and clarification of affordable plans for both sides for the numbers above average. What's the cause of this? I think that's what we had. Um, anything else that we asked for that we want to get back by next week? Okay. All right. Next week, the topics are, um, Ms. Williams, can you bring up those topics? I think they're... Sure. I think it's um, local preference application selection process of the two. Is that right? Yes. One moment. Let me try to get both documents side by side. Here we go. Okay. So, yeah, we have um, application selection process and local preference. And both those can take some time uh, to go through. I see it tonight, we're, we're at about eight o'clock and we probably have a little more time. If we, had prepared, if we had prepared for it, we could have also used the application selection process, but we thought we had another, um, another application ahead of, before us tonight. So that's the reason we took these two, I just did these two, um, these three issues, property management, income restrictions and financials. Next week, we don't have anything else. It's just solely wayfinders. So application selection process, which is complicated, just like the financials are. Local preference, which is um, something that we always spend some time talking with. And we do have the, the waivers that they're requesting is a number of waivers, a, a large number of waivers. And uh, Ms. Murray, I know you're helping us out on looking at the waivers. Is it possible that we could start um, looking at the waiver requests not with, not with the hope of finish them, finishing them all up next week, but we could start looking at the waiver requests next week if we get through um, application selection and local preference and we have some time. I think you certainly could, or at least, uh, Mr. Chair, have the applicant go through it and kind of explain what they're seeking and why. Yeah. Some of them, I think, are pretty straightforward, but others are, are going to be more complicated. So... We're, we're so, let, let's plan on doing application and local preference for sure. Let's also look at, we'll start the waiver process as far as we, as, as we can get. Um, but there, you've got, I don't know, 30 or 40 waivers at least, quite a few waivers that we need to go through. So we can start the process there depending on time. Does that work for um, the applicant as well as for the other members of the board? Okay, well, let's, let's do that so we can get on, on to that. Okay. Um, before we leave this this application, I want to make sure that we avail our the public with a chance to comment on this application tonight. If anybody wishes to comment, if you do wish to comment, please raise your hand. Let um, let us know that you wish to wish to comment when you are called upon. Please give your name and address to the uh, for the record and try to keep your comments to three minutes. Ms. Williams, do we have anybody who has raised their hand? No, we don't. Okay. All right. If there's no other, no other comments from the public, no other comments from the board, I would entertain a motion that we uh, continue this hearing until six o'clock on October 17th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second moved and seconded. Is there any discussion regarding that motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to continue this till next week at six o'clock on the 17th. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. The motion carries. Um, Ms. Fryman, you have your hands up. Um, so there's two members that are not present tonight. So in between this week and next week, will be, they be watching the tape and um, filling out the forms so they could participate? I, I certainly hope so. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, their yeah, that's, that's their responsibility. And they, they're both experienced members, and I think they know they need to do that. Okay, so, great. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, they should. And, and our top-notch staff will remind them. 
of the responsibility to do that too. Great, thank you. Good. That's one good reason the meeting's a little shorter. They have less to watch. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of reasons the meeting, or good reasons for the meeting to be a little shorter. <laughs> There's a lot of good reasons. Anyway, okay. Um, is there any other, um, the last order of business before we go into new business is general discussion. Uh, the public has an opportunity to discuss any matter before, not except matters before us tonight. So anything but the matter before us tonight. If anybody in the public wishes to speak, they may do so now for three minutes. If they raise their hand, we can permit that. Any, anybody raising their hand, Ms. Williams? All right, no public comment. Um, we've talked about the schedules. Um, is there any other new business that people wish to raise, board members wishes to raise, or the staff? We have um, upcoming meetings on the 17th. We've got Wayfinders on the 24th. We've got 328 College Street and 47 Redgate Lane, I think are the two that we have coming up. Yes, that's correct. Right. Um, on the 14th, we'll have, we'll have uh, half wayfinders. But I, I my, suspe my suspicion is that unless there's another um, application, that there won't be a lot of discussion about this Shootsbury Solar project. I don't think there's been a lot of uh, progress there. Am I, am I wrong, Ms. Williams? Do you know of any large, uh, any desire for a large presentation or a lot of discussion on the Shootsbury sure Road? they're going to do. They may ask to continue or maybe they'll have some developments. We'll, we'll staff will talk and then we'll get back. All to right. Them. So, so we've had, we'll have at least half the meeting on Wayfinders on the 14th, half the full meeting on the 21st, and then we'll, we hope to be looking towards having a dis, having decisions in early December, and we're trying not to run this into January, if that's at all possible. So I think we're making good progress. I wanna applaud the staff for all the work on this, the board members, as well as Wayfinders. Um, I think you've really tried to respond to our questions, and we appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate the hard work that everybody's doing. Um, if there's no other questions, no other comments, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. Um, the motion is non-debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. The vote is three to nothing with two absent. Motion carries. We are adjourned. And we'll see you next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.